<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to our psychiatry uh, grand rounds. We have the pleasure of having as a speaker uh, Dr. Wilkinson. He received his bachelor's in psychology and zoology at the University of Michigan, his PhD in psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and completed his postdoctoral work in physiology at the University of California, San Francisco, and in endocrinology and pharmacology at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. He's been a research physiology in the Genetic Research Education and Clinical Center at the VA Puget Sound since 1982, and has collaborated closely with Drs. Murray Raskin and Lane Peskin. Throughout his career, until recently, his research has focused on physiologic and pathophysiologic function of the hypoth hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical system and neuroendocrine regulation of behavioral responses to stress in healthy aging. Alzheimer's disease, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, Parkinson's, and schizophrenia. His research now focuses on pituitary dysfunction after blast-induced mild traumatic brain injury and the consequences for behavior, cognition, mood, sleep, and quality of life. He currently serves on the editorial boards of Frontiers in Behavioral Neuroscience and Frontiers in Neurotrauma and on the VA Rehabilitation of Research and Development Scientific Merit Review Board for Brain Injury, Traumatic Brain Injury, and Stroke. During his career, he has authored or co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Wilkinson. Good afternoon, and thank you for that extensive introduction, my life story. Uh, this, uh, this presentation will involve a certain uh, amount of advocacy. So I'd like to say that uh, all of the opinions expressed here are my own. They don't represent at all the policies of either the Department of Veterans Affairs or the Department of Defense, or for that matter, the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, I'm on my own here. Uh, since uh, the title refers to mild traumatic brain injury, I'll start by presenting a, a definition of the term. Mild traumatic brain injury and concussion are often used synonymously, although within the area there is controversy about which is preferable and uh, there are some people who don't uh, like either one. The most widely accepted definition of mild traumatic brain injury is that from the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine that defines it as a traumatic disruption of brain function manifested by at least one of the following, a loss of consciousness, a lo a amnesia for events immediately surrounding the trauma, alteration in mental state, uh, disorientation, confusion, or focal neurologic deficit. And again, presence of any one of these meets the conditions for mild traumatic brain injury. However, to remain classified as mild, uh, the severity of the injury cannot exceed loss of consciousness for more than 30 minutes or post-traumatic amnesia for more than 24 hours. You can probably guess my answer to this question. Uh, TBI is sustained by approximately 1.7 million Americans annually, and 75% of those cases are mild TBI or concussion and blast-induced MTBI uh, results uh, resulting from the increasing use of improvised explosive devices is one of the most frequent injuries sustained in modern military operations. Over two million U.S. service members have been deployed to Iraq and or Afghanistan, and many of them have been deployed more than once, and 10 to, percent, 10 to 20 percent of those, um, or 200,000 to 400,000, the returnees from deployment in Iraq or Afghanistan report having had at least one concussion. In our subject population, the modal number of concussions is five. Uh, due to the nature of uh, military culture, TBI is vastly underreported, especially concussions. This chart shows the incidence of medically diagnosed TBI of 
each level of severity over the last 12 years. And uh, the incidence of mild TBI has increased rapidly, especially in the last six or seven years. Again, this is uh, medically diagnosed MTBI. And during the past two years, the incidence, the yearly incidence of all levels of TBI has exceeded 30,000 cases a year, and more than 75% of those are mild TBI. The mechanisms of brain injury from uh, blast exposure are highly complex and very unpredictable. The blast pressure wave is propagated both through the skull and indirectly through the vasculature. Um, it can, uh, the pressure wave can cause rapid acceleration, deceleration, and rotation of the brain. And in a confined space, such as a combat vehicle, uh, the reflections of the blast wave can be altered and magnified. It's as if you have uh, blast pressure waves coming from multiple directions within a few seconds of one another. And the, the blast effects also can include uh, shrapnel, extreme heat, toxic gases, and electromagnetic waves. Since my title also said that I'd be talking about the pituitary gland, I'd better do that also. I'll, I'll present a, just a brief uh, introduction or a review of pituitary anatomy and why it's susceptible particularly to traumatic brain injury. Uh, pituitary, which is often referred to as the master gland, is a small gland about the size of a garbanzo bean that's located at the base of the brain. And the pituitary is tethered to the hypothalamus by a very thin pituitary stalk. It's about two to three <coughs> millimeters in diameter, and it carries the neural supply and the primary vascular supply to the pituitary. That stalk is very vulnerable to uh, rotational forces caused by brain movement. And the pituitary gland itself is almost entirely encased in a pocket of the sphenoid bone called the cella turcica. And because of that confinement, it's very vulnerable to compression due to brain movement or to edema. Uh, in addition, the pituitary is uh, susceptible to damage from uh, vascular pressure surges and from damage of hypothalamic neurons that regulate its function. Within the pituitary, there's variation, regional variation in vulnerability. The growth hormone secreting cells are, um, I guess, uh, don't need it. Uh, the growth hormone secreting cells or somatotropes, somatotropes are located primarily in the lateral wings of pituitary, which are relatively exposed. And also those cells depend almost exclusively on vascular input from the hypophyseal portal system that runs down the pituitary stalk. At the other extreme are the ACTH and thyroid stimulating hormone producing cells that are in the protected median wedge of the pituitary and they have an alternative blood, so uh, blood supply so they're uh, less vulnerable. The gonadotrophin secreting cells, those that secrete luteinizing hormone or follicle stimulating hormone are spread, distributed pretty evenly throughout the gland and they and the prolactin secreting cells are intermediate in vulnerability. And these levels of vulnerability uh, correlate fairly well to the frequency of, of hormone deficiencies that have been found in studies of pituitary dysfunction after TBI. In cases of where pituitary dysfunction after TBI does exist, the nature of the hormonal abnormalities changes over time. Uh, Initially, after the trauma, there's multiple abnormalities, and often over the next few months, those will resolve, but at the same time, a smaller proportion of new dysfunctions occurred, emerge belatedly. After one year, the pattern is generally considered to be relatively stable and chronic. And everything that I'm gonna talk, be talking about today, both uh, some earlier studies that have been done and, and our own preliminary study, everything will refer to chronic uh, pituitary dysfunction after TBI. I'll use the term hypopituitarism, and I'm defining that, or the common definition is the deficiency in one or more pituitary hormonic axes, for instance, pituitary adrenal, pituitary gonadal, and post-traumatic hypopituitarism after TBI was first reported in 1918 
During the next 80 or so years, there were only scattered reports. It was considered very rare, and it attracted little attention. Uh, in the year 2000, uh, a burst of studies uh, appeared, uh, and uh, it's still an area that's, that's uh, very much unknown, but several studies appeared starting in the year 2000. This is uh, a list of the studies by first author with a year of publication, the number of patients involved, and the percentage of hypopituitarism that was found. You can see that this, uh, the prevalence of hypopituitarism in this study varied wildly uh, from 5% to 90%. And this is largely due to the fact that the, the methods of assessment and the criteria that were used varied widely. However, more than half of these studies, oh, I should mention one thing, these were all studies of impact TBI. Uh, nobody had looked at BLAST MTBI before our studies, or nobody had published anything. And uh, the impacts TBI that they studied were of a wide range of severity and included repetitive sports injuries in a couple of the studies also. So more than half of those studies of impact-induced TBI reported a prevalence of between 20% and 40%. And most of those studies focused on anterior pituitary function. They did not address posterior pituitary function. In our preliminary study of hypopituitarism after BLAST MTBI, we found a prevalence of 42%, and we were looking at both anterior and posterior pituitary hormones. Compare those numbers with the estimated prevalence of hypopituitarism from all causes in the general population, which is 300 cases per million, or three hundredths of a percent. The symptoms of what I'll call PTHP for short, and PTSD overlap considerably. Uh, among them are anxiety and irritability, social isolation and depression, uh, sexual and sleep disturbances, cognitive and attention deficits, fatigue, and poor quality of life. These symptoms, if they result from PTSD, are often resistant to successful treatment. I think many of you, most all of you probably are aware of that. However, if the symptoms result from pituitary dysfunction, they're generally responsive to successful treatment with hormone replacement therapy. So. Uh, we feel that failure to consider the diagnosis of PTHP may result in inappropriate and ineffective treatment of these symptoms if they are indeed of neuroendocrine origin. So the rationale for our study is the high frequency of post-traumatic hypopituitarism after impact that's been found in these earlier studies and the fact that no one else had investigated the prevalence of pituitary dysfunction after BLAST MTBI and our primary questions were whether BLAST MTBI results in comparable rates of chronic pituitary hormone deficiencies as those found in the earlier studies of impact TBI. We have preliminary data from two groups of male U.S. combat veterans of deployment to Iraq and or Afghanistan. Uh, the reason we don't have any female subjects is because, uh, by law, women are excluded from combat roles, although in a combat like Iraq or Afghanistan, that doesn't mean they're, they're not exposed. But in a, a larger study that uh, is sort of a, a partner study of mine, uh, women were uh, included in the uh, subject population, but it's almost impossible to get to recruit women because of the, the small numbers who were exposed to blast. Also, for our purposes, the hormonal profiles are so different between men and women that uh, to try to compare them would be meaningless. So it, it's all an all-male population. And uh, our TBI group uh, were diagnosed with last TBI, the T group, and our deployment control group were participants who experienced the same deployment conditions but weren't exposed to BLAST. And that so far is a very small group. And we measured basal concentrations of 12 pituitary and target organ hormones in blood samples from these veterans. By target organ hormones, I mean hormones from other glands that are stimulated by uh, the action of pituitary hormones. And we evaluated those hormones in relation to reference ranges that we established for age-matched healthy community control subjects. 
Inclusion criteria were males aged 21 to 40 years with a body mass index between 18 and 36. Uh, the inclusion criteria for the TBI group were documented hazardous duty, blast concussion meeting the ACRM criteria for MTBI, and the condition that the last blast exposure occurred at least one year prior to the study. And again, that's because we want to focus on chronic pituitarism, hypopituitarism after TBI. Inclusion criteria for the deployment control group is the same documented hazardous duty, but no blast <coughs> exposure, no history of head trauma, and this group is age and BMI matched uh, with a TBI group. Exclusion criteria for all participants is a penetrating head wound, excuse me, penetrating head wound, <laughs> a seizure disorder, or insulin-dependent diabetes, and uh, DSM-IV diagnosis of alcohol substance abuse, um, schizophrenia, other psychotic disorders, bipolar disorders, or dementia. And uh, we also excluded medications likely to affect cognitive performance. And these conditions are not exclusionary. One is the use of medications. The only exceptions, are, or the very few exceptions, including the ones I just mentioned, were also not excluding PTSD. The reasons for this is that in, well, several reasons actually, in blast exposed veterans of combat in Iraq or Afghanistan, you're gonna find very, very few of them who are not using medications or who do not have a diagnosis of PTSD. So recruitment would be um, almost impossible. But more importantly, uh, we want our screening procedures to reflect real-world conditions. And uh, it just, it's not meaningful at all to, to exclude uh, people with medications or PTSD. And the other aspect is that we would like to look at subjects with PTSD to see if perhaps their diagnosis of PTSD is due to hormonal deficiencies. <laughs> so the other... Um, factor that we're not excluding is pre-existing pituitary dysfunction or current hormone therapy. We'll query the existence of these conditions, but um, we'll still uh, screen for other abnormalities. Okay, these are the hormones that we're going to be measuring. Growth hormone, uh, pituitary hormone that stimulates hepatic production of insulin-like growth factor one. IGF-1, which is involved in regulation and metabolic function. Luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, which are released from the pituitary and uh, promote spermatogenesis and testosterone secretion from the testes. Prolactin, which also has pronounced effect on sexual and reproductive uh, function. Adrenocorticotropin, ACTH, which stimulates production of cortisol by the adrenal and thyroid stimulating hormone, which uh, activates the release of thyroxin from the thyroid gland. So in addition to those 10 hormones, were, which are all anterior pituitary hormones or their target organs, target organ hormones, we're measuring two posterior pituitary hormones, vasopressin and oxytocin. In the next few slides, I'm going to describe, I'm gonna present a list of potential symptoms resulting from each specific pituitary disorder. And those lists are not, uh, uh, they're very, very inclusive. I'm not uh, trying to imply that those symptoms would occur in, in every case of a particular pituitary dysfunction. And following each one of those listings of symptoms, I'll show data for that particular hormone um, from our study. I mentioned earlier that the most vulnerable cells in the pituitary are the growth hormone, growth hormone secreting cells. And that's been borne out, as I said, in, in the prevalence of growth hormone deficiency in uh, patients after TBI. You might wonder why that's relevant in an adult population, but uh, growth hormone deficiency has been increasingly recognized as a very serious condition in adults that uh, results in uh, s several serious negative effects, including um, increased incidence of a number of dimensions of quality of life, with fatigue being one of the most common, 
Again, these may seem very similar to symptoms of PTSD. There are also detrimental effects on metabolism, including elevated plasma triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol, high degree of lipidemia, uh, negative effects on body composition, increased fat, decreased muscle and bone, and an increased risk for hypertension and cardiovascular mortality. Growth hormone, because of its pulsatile, the pulsatile nature of its secretion and the fact that daytime levels are extremely low, uh, getting single measurements of serum growth hormone are not at all reliable indices of growth hormone deficiency. However, its uh, target hormone, IGF-1, can be a good indicator. Uh, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this slide. There's a lot here. Uh, this is a plot of IGF-1 concentration uh, as a function of age. And uh, we're identifying abnormal hormone concentrations on the basis of the concentrations in our reference, the distribution of hormone concentrations in our reference control group. I won't be presenting any data from that reference group, but on each one of the data slides from our uh, subjects, there will be a line that represents uh, a specific per percentile of uh, the hormone distribution in the reference group. And we're using that percentile as a marker. Anything either below or above, depending on the, <laughs> the percentile, is uh, assumed to be an abnormal level. Is that making any sense? Okay, um, I'll, I'll illustrate that in further slides. But, uh, we're using that as a basis for setting a percentile, and then those percentile levels are what we use as our cutoffs. That's a little better. Uh, in this case, the, the red line is uh, the age-adjusted 10th percentile of IGF-1 level in our subject population. IGF-1 declines markedly with age, and that age relationship needs to be taken into account in any interpretation of the data. The uh, data from our deployment control subjects is shown in the purple triangles and data from our uh, TBI subjects in the yellow circles. Uh, another aspect of, about, of IGF-1 as a marker of growth hormone deficiency is that many individuals who have growth hormone deficiency have normal or even elevated IGF-1 levels. So it doesn't select all those with growth hormone deficiency. However, if IGF-1 levels are markedly low. That's a very, very strong marker that, uh, that growth hormone deficiency exists. And in our two groups, we had none of our subjects, deployment control subjects, had IGF-1 levels below uh, the 10th percentile cutoff, but five of the TBI subjects were below that line, uh, which is considered indicative of potential growth hormone deficiency. I want to stress that our hormonal markers are screening tools. We don't at all intend for them to be interpreted as providing a clinical diagnosis. <laughs> Symptoms of hypogonadism are fairly well known. Uh, sexual dysfunction, infertility, <coughs> decreased energy, motivation, irritability is often a, a frequent sim symptom, sleep disturbance, and again, uh, like growth hormone, uh, negative effects on body composition, loss of muscle, increase in body fat. And our criterion for hypogonadism is based on both the testosterone and gonadotropin concentrations. Uh, testosterone indicated on the right panel, luteinizing hormone on the left. I'm not showing the data for follicle stimulating hormone. And our Dual criteria are a testosterone concentration below the fifth percentile together with either luteinizing hormone or follicle stimulating hormone below the tenth percentile of their distributions. And again, here the uh, deployment control group is data is represented by the purple triangles, the uh, TBI group by the yellow circles. And only three individuals, all of whom were in the TBI group, met both those criteria. In other words, below the fifth percentile in testosterone, below the tenth percentile in LH. And those are indicated by the green circles. 
the other ones below the lines were deficient in one but not the other. Now, prolactin also has major effects on sexual function and reproductive function, and both hypo and hyperprolactinemia can result in significant medical conditions. And prolactin is unique among the pituitary hormones because it's under uh, predominantly inhibitory control by dopamine. And hyperprolactinemia is by far the more common of the two, and it's frequently the result of the use of antipsychotic medications that are used to suppress dopamine. And in suppressing dopamine, they release prolactin from its inhibitory break, so the prolactin levels increase. And some of the effects of hyperprolactinemia, or potential effects, are hypogodantism resulting from uh, modulation of luteinizing hormone levels and blocking the stimulation of testosterone, oligospermia and infertility, and effects on specific aspects of <coughs> sexual function, and also decrease in bone and bone mineral density. Hypoprolactinemia is extremely rare in the absence of other pituitary hormone deficits, but it's associated with metabolic syndrome. Again, uh, can lead to lipidemia. And also, again, like hyperprolactinemia, it's associated with specific uh, sexual dysfunction problem, sexual dysfunction. And it may also result in reduced basal testosterone production. Okay. So for prolactin, since um, either uh, excessive secretion or deficient secretion can lead to significant problems, we have two cutoffs. Anything above the 95th percentile or below the 5th percentile is considered abnormal. Again, all of the deployment, sub deployment control subjects are in the our normal range, and one of the uh, TBI group is, uh, <coughs> has a prolactin level well over the 95th percentile, and the other has a, a sub-5th percentile concentration. Of the three, uh, two of the three uh, individuals who were found to be, to have probable hypogonadism are the two indicated by the, the green circles here. Um, it's supporting evidence, uh, or could be viewed as supporting evidence that, uh, of hypogonadism in those subjects. I'll move on to the posterior pituitary. Um, again, this is a vasopressin is a hormone uh, for which both very low levels or high levels can result in medical problems. Low levels result in excessive thirst and excretion of large amounts of um, large amounts of severely diluted urine, and high levels uh, can result in water retention and excess excretion of sodium. Uh, vasopressin is also associated with learning and memory, and there have been uh, quite a few studies in recent years showing a, a relationship of high vasopressin concentrations with anxiety and depression and aggression, and also a large number of studies uh, showing relationships or associations between high levels of plasma or CSF vasopressin and several psychiatric disorders. And none of these studies, as far as I know anyway, found any causal relationships. Uh, uh, they're all associational studies. So our criterion for excess vasopressin, con uh, excess vasopressin levels was a concentration above the 95th percentile. And we had a combined criteria for vasopressin deficiency. And those two criteria were concentration below the fifth percentile together with the presence of extremely dilute urine. The cutoff for the urine was 1.003, a urine specific gravity of 1.003. So subject, only subjects who met uh, both those sub-threshold criteria were considered to be functionally vasopressin deficient. And those two individuals who met both criteria are in the green again, green circles. So we have two with excessive vasopressin secretion, two that are functionally um, vasopressin deficient. Oxytocin for many years was considered to be involved in uh, 
almost exclusively in uh, uterine contractions and milk letdown. Uh, recent work has uh, prompted the popular press to refer it to it as the love hormone. It plays a role in multiple aspects of maternal, social, and romantic bonding in humans and in animals, to the extent that they have romantic bonding, I guess. Uh, it has significant anxiolytic and anti-stress effects in social approach to behavior and in socially challenging situations. It promotes social recognition, interpretation of social signals, and it's released in positive social interactions and it's been linked to uh, social attitudes including trust and empathy, generosity, and extremely low levels have been uh, and genetic variations in oxytocin receptors have been associated with mental disorders characterized by severe social disturbances, including autism. So, uh, these slides are beginning to look familiar, I'm sure. Uh, our <coughs> cutoff for uh, abnormal oxytocin is the fifth percentile level. And I'm showing that together with the vasopressin slide because um, two of the TBI subjects with subthreshold uh, oxytocin concentrations were those that were identified as meeting both the criteria for functional vasopressin deficiency. That suggests to us those uh, dual deficiencies in these two hormones suggest that there may be, in those individuals, maybe disruption of the axons in the pituitary stalk that release those hormones or hypothalamic damage. Back to the anterior pituitary briefly, these are the symptoms of hypothyroidism, uh, or some of the symptoms, excessive fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, depression, and anxiety. In our measures, uh, again, we had a combined criterion of, of looking at both the pituitary hormones and the target organ hormones. In measuring thyroid simulating hormone and thyroxin, we found no evidence of hypothyroidism in any of our subjects. These are the symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, including fatigue and weakness, cognitive impairment, social withdrawal. Again, by measuring ACTH and cortisol, we found no evidence of adrenal insufficiency. These findings fit with the relative vulnerability of the pituitary hormones, since these are in the, both the ACTH and TSH are in the protected median area of the pituitary. <coughs> Okay, these are summary data of the hormone, abnormal hormone levels in the 11 of 26 of our TBI subjects that were found to have one or more hormonal abnormalities. I guess the picture will be useful here. Well. Okay. Uh, five of the TBI subjects were found with IGF-1 levels below the age-adjusted threshold that we were using. Three of the veterans in the TBI group were uh, found to be hypogonadal or potentially hypogonadal based on our testosterone and luteinizing hormone measures. And of those three, two had aberrant prolactin levels, two had the very lowest of the <laughs> IGF-1 levels, uh, I give up, uh, and one had an unmeasurable oxytocin level. In addition to uh, the veterans with anterior pituitary hormone uh, abnormalities, six individuals showed uh, abnormal levels of either vas vasopressin and or oxytocin. Uh, the next step that we're going to take, uh, we're going to continue the, this preliminary study based on uh, basal hormone levels, but we have plans to expand the study considerably, and the VA is going to fund those. Uh, basal hormone values that I've showed, they're appropriate for screening uh, deficiencies in most axes, at least uh, identifying those individuals who need <coughs> clinical follow-up. However, both growth hormone and ACTH deficiencies are usually assumed to require provocative testing in order to um, 
pass them on, as it were, to uh, clinical evaluation. And the insulin tolerance test is the gold standard for identifying the growth hormone and ACTH deficiencies. Uh, because of the, uh, the severe hypoglycemia, the results from the insulin injection uh, is a marked stimulus to growth hormone and ACTH responses. You have huge responses in normal individuals who don't have deficiencies. However, the ITT is contraindicated after head injury or seizures. Uh, because of the hypoglycemia, it's uh, very unpleasant for the subjects. It requires intensive medical supervision, and it's expensive. Uh, another uh, means of testing for growth hormone and provocative testing for growth hormone and ACTH deficiency <coughs> is the glucagon simulation test, which is gaining acceptability. And no one knows the mechanism by which glucagon stimulates ACTH or growth hormone. It's not hypoglycemia. Uh, after the, the glucagon injection, there's initially a hyperglycemia that uh, over time during the first two hours or more, and then very slowly uh, glucose levels decline, and uh, there's a very mild, uh, eventual very mild hypoglycemia. Our plan is to use the glucagon simulation test as a definitive index of growth hormone and ACTH deficiencies uh, to which we'll compare other measures. And the goal is to attempt to reduce the need for provocative testing by uh, combining a variety of other types of data that can hopefully mirror the results that we get with the, with the glucagon simulation test. And among those other tests are cognitive tests, behavioral self-reports, including uh, alcohol use, sleep, fatigue, depression, measures of body composition, uh, measures of uh, serum lipids and uh, osmolality and electrolytes. And as we fine tune these uh, measures to get the best possible predictability, we'll also continually readjust our criteria for basal levels of IGF-1, ACTH, and cortisol. And we'll use feedback from uh, clinical referral of our subjects who are found to have deficiency to fine tune um, our criteria. So the goal is to optimally weight the various data with uh, the design of approximating the predictive accuracy of GST. Uh, in summary, our preliminary study uh, found 42% of the participants with blast MTBI had evidence of hypopituitarism and we consider this a uh, strong indication that blast MTBI carries a significant risk uh, for pituitary dysfunction. And we understand that provocative testing and clinical assessment are necessary to establish definitive diagnosis. But we feel that the use of our basal hormone levels together with a battery of other tests can reduce the need for provocative testing. And markedly increase the efficiency of the screening process and decrease the cost, duration, and discomfort to veterans of the screening procedures. In light of the fact that PTHP is associated with uh, a number of symptoms that are common to PTSD, uh, we feel that Routine screening for pituitary dysfunction after blast concussion uh, shows promise for identifying individuals whose symptoms are indeed of neuroendocrine origin and in those individuals for directing diagnostic and therapeutic strategies that would otherwise not be considered and markedly facilitating recovery and rehabilitation after blast induced and other forms of traumatic brain injury. And I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues and staff who contributed to this work. Uh, this list is a list of the people involved in the preliminary study that's still ongoing. This list is going to expand greatly as we move into the next phase. And I'd like to thank the veterans who volunteered to participate, uh, without, which we, without whom we couldn't have done the study. And uh, the organizations involved. The preliminary study was funded by the Department of Defense. The uh, larger study, which is just beginning, was funded from a grant from VA Rehabilitation R&D, and uh, resources from GREC and MIREC and R&D and the VA were uh, indispensable. And 
Seattle Institute for Biomedical and Clinical Research administered the DOD, is administering the DOD grant. And I'd like to put in a plug for our initial publication in this work. It's the first uh, publication of effects of BLAST, TBI, and pituitary dysfunction. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. You think it's important? Yeah. <laughs> I do, obviously. Yeah, really excited yeah. to see what the results are. Now, uh, this, uh, well, personal note, this really uh, jump-started my career. I was getting stale and old. Uh, <laughs> I'm still getting old. <laughs> but but um, I was almost ready to retire when I sort of stumbled into this area, and it totally revitalized me. So, anyway. but we haven't really looked at that. When we get a larger sample, we will. Um, <coughs> there are studies that have shown the chronic or abnormalities existing for many years afterwards, uh, but we haven't, we haven't established that. We do have the data, but we haven't, we haven't looked at that yet. 
One thing I should say also about the earlier studies of impact TBI and their effect on pituitary dysfunction, there doesn't seem to be any relationship between the severity of the injury and the frequency of pituitary dysfunction. Uh, there's, again, that's a little bit controversial, but most of the studies do not find a relationship. So penetrating head injury and a concussion might produce the same result. It's, it's, it's largely the acceleration and deceleration of the brain um, because that pituitary stock is so vulnerable. It's, uh, it's an area that, uh, again, as I said in the beginning, there, there have been that burst of studies in the last dozen years, but it's an area that's uh, both among endocrinologists and, and neurologists, I feel, is very both unknown and underappreciated. I'm, I'm biased. <laughs> what can I say? So, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh,